Hi all, Alicia Tubbs here with The Sudden Homesteader, and today I want to talk about prophecy, because prophecy is something that's not really being taught a whole lot in the churches here in America, and if it is, it's the churches or church leaders who are doing the main teaching are not making the connections between the prophetic books and what they said about the second coming of Christ to what's happening nowadays in our history. There's a disconnect. And this could just come from an ignorance. They just may not be aware of the passages that are talking about the second coming and how those have not yet been fulfilled. This could just be from a willful neglect or rebellion against God's word. Could be a simple misunderstanding of God's word. Or it could be that many churches or church leaders or certain denominations are adhering to certain dogmas or doctrines or methods of teaching the Bible that suppress the connections, the clear connections, between what God spoke would happen at the end of the age and what is currently happening at our time in history. And the purpose of this video is I want to encourage all of you, lay people like myself, just average congregants, to study the Bible on your own and to study prophecy on your own especially if you're in a church where they're not teaching it or not teaching it well, because we are all still responsible for God's word. If you live in America, you most likely have a Bible or you have an internet connection where you have multiple translations of the Bible in English available to you. All Christians have the Holy Spirit we all have access to the throne of God because of Jesus Christ, because he gave his blood on the cross so that we could have access to the throne room and we have access to God and we can ask him to teach us prophecy because it's his book and the prophecies are from him and he loves to teach his children. He loves to give us wisdom. And God has also gifted certain teachers with the ability to teach prophecy and thanks to the internet, we can access those teachings even if we do not belong to that church. So there are a few churches that do teach prophecy and teach it well. And praise God, they have been posting their videos online. I think particularly of Sugarland Bible Church, where Andy Woods is the pastor. He does a phenomenal job teaching prophecy. I highly recommend that you look into his lecture series on things like the book of Daniel. Revelation, Zechariah. He's currently doing a series on Ezekiel called the Middle East Meltdown. It is so relevant to what's happening today in our current events. I highly, highly recommend you spend much time watching those videos. I can think of Ken Johnson. He's a Bible teacher over in Kansas at a Calvary Chapel, and there are many others. Point being, we have all of these resources. There's no excuse for any of us to be ignorant about prophecy regardless of what we've been taught in church or haven't been taught in church. And there are no excuses when we stand before God. The Bible tells us that God does not show partiality. Yes, he is going to hold church leaders and teachers to a strict standard. The Bible makes that clear. Uh, so if your church leaders are not teaching prophecy well, they're going to have to talk to God about that. That's going to be between them and God. But you are still without excuse. Okay, you can't say to God, well, I didn't really, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for Jesus. I didn't really think this would happen. I didn't think I would meet you so soon because, you know, I was taught wrong. Another pushback that I get from Christians when it comes to the topic of prophecy is that only the Father knows when this age will end. Yes, that is true. Only the Father knows when this age will end. This relates back to the Jewish wedding tradition in which only the Father had the right to tell the Son it was time to go pick up his bride. So yes, when the Father says to Jesus, okay, you've built enough rooms onto my house, looks good, house is ready, you can go get your bride, only the Father has the right to do that. Only the Father can say, Jesus, it's time, go pick up the church. And yes, the bride is the church, as the Bible tells us. But even though only the Father knows when exactly this age is going to end, Jesus still commands us to know the signs and to stay ready. We are commanded to not be taken 
when this day comes. Jesus rebuked people who did not recognize the signs of his first coming very harshly. So why wouldn't he do the same for his second coming when he's given us even more signs. There are even more signs in the Bible that talk about his second coming. In fact, we are supposed to know Bible prophecy so well that his second coming doesn't surprise us. And there's many passages that point to this. One of those is 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Right? We're not supposed to be taken by surprise by the end. And Luke chapter 21, one of the passages of the Olivet Discourse, which you can also find in Matthew chapters 24 through 25, as well as Mark chapter 13. In these chapters, Jesus gives many signs that tell us that the end is near. And in Luke chapter 21, 28, Jesus says, Now when these things begin to take place, Straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So when these signs that Jesus very clearly spells out begin to take place, that's when we're supposed to look up because he's going to come in the clouds and we are going to be completely redeemed, resurrected. Another pushback I hear whenever I talk about prophecy is we need to just love people as Christians. That's our job. And we need to let the end times take care of itself. You know, we'll figure it all out when it happens. Yes, Jesus' golden rule was to love others as we love ourselves. What greater love can you give to the world than being a light in times of darkness? When you study prophecy, you are internalizing God's word and all that he has said about what's going on all around you so that people can come to you when they're looking around and they're wondering, what's with all the pandemics? What's with all the earthquakes? Why is war breaking out? Why is there so much violence? They can come to you and you could be a source of light, a source of life for them, of hope. And you can say, well, God said this would happen. Let me take you to the Bible. And ideally, you'll have a chance at that point to also share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is such a great love for you to prepare yourself as a resource for others. That is a great act of love. And that definitely would fall under and not run counter to God's command for us to love others as ourselves. And then there's the statement that I'll just find out about the end when the end time actually comes. I don't need to know that now. It's so divisive and people fight over it. So I just really shouldn't bother studying it now. To this, I would reply, God wouldn't have given us his word about the end times if he didn't want us to read it now. Why would, he, why would it even be in the canon if we're not supposed to know about it? If he wanted us to be uninformed and to learn about the end times later, well, then he would have saved this information for later, but he didn't. In the next age, we're probably going to have more information, and that information probably builds on the canon that we have now. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to add books to the canon, but if he's going to, he has every right to because he's God. You know, he wouldn't have given us the information that we have now if he wanted us to be ignorant of it. So we need to learn everything about the Bible that we can now. We don't want to be playing catch up as the end unfolds rather than being prepared like he commanded. The Bible also commands us to rightly divide scripture, to know the beginning from the end, to know where the ages begin and end. And God also commands us to study his word diligently. He didn't t command us to study his word but only the parts that aren't about prophecy, right? No, he commanded us to study all of his word, to rightly divide the scripture, and to be diligent. We can see this in what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. So we are to be diligent so that we can present ourselves approved to God. Another point I would like to make is that there is blessing in studying prophecy. 
The book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that promises a blessing for those who read it. Now this could mean the blessing is for those who read it out loud to others, but you could easily make that happen. You could read it to your family. You could read it on the internet and post it on YouTube. You could read it out loud with your church or as a church. 2 Timothy 4.8 also talks about a crown of righteousness, which is for those who are waiting for Jesus, who are ready. It says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. To all of us who are ready, who are eager for his appearing, there is a crown just for being eager for his appearing. But how can you be eager for his appearing if you don't want to study anything that has to do with his appearing? I mean, sure, I guess you could say that all Christians can be ready for his appearing, whether they study prophecy or not. But just think of how much more in love with his appearing you will be the more that you know about it. Another point I would like to make is that God holds prophecy in very high esteem. And we see this in verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 27 through 28. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. And it goes on to speak about the gifts that God has given to the church body. But if you notice, the office of prophet is second to the office of apostle. I don't know about you, but I do not know any church that has a prophet on staff or even just a lay person who undertakes the function of prophet. And you may be wondering what a prophet is. The most fundamental definition of a prophet is someone who speaks God's messages or a message to a certain population or to the leader of that population. And it's usually to warn of God's judgment or to warn of events that God promised was going to happen. So someone who speaks God's word and makes clear to people how that word is going to come to pass. Many times the prophets of the Old Testament would perform miracles or have visions of God on his throne. And that would prove their validity as a prophet. As far as biblical prophecy, as prophecy that's included in the Bible, the canon is closed. Everything that God has spoken about the end times cannot be added to. Like there's not going to be a new event that a prophet's going to talk about that hasn't already been spoken about in the Bible because Revelation tells us, do not add to or subtract from these words. So in terms of canonical prophecies, there's not going to be any more of those, but a person may have certain insights or get a vision or have a dream that will help to build up a certain church body. And if this person is accurate all the time, that would be a prophet. Um, and hopefully that person would also be able to teach prophecy. At the very, very least, churches should have someone on staff who can teach prophecy. It doesn't have to be paid possession. It could just be someone who's known for studying prophecy and who's able to enlighten others about prophecy, who's able to tell them what God has already said and explain how that's happening or how it has happened throughout history. And that technically would be a son of a prophet, but it would fulfill at the most basic level the office of prophet, which God holds second to apostle. And there's many other Verses that show that God holds prophecy in high esteem. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 5, Paul writes, For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Right, so don't laugh at prophets. Don't laugh at prophecies. Test them. If they're true, then the prophecy is true. Then the prophet is reliable. If they're false, then you have a false prophet on your hands, and hopefully that person will repent. Even in the book of Numbers, when God has Moses select elders, Moses says to Joshua, Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So even Moses desired for everyone to be a prophet. Another reason why we need to study prophecy is that Many books of the Bible contain prophecy, 
not just those that are traditionally categorized as prophetic. There are prophecies throughout the Torah, many of them which get fulfilled during Moses' and Joshua's time, but many which were still future to that time. Even the book of Psalms, which is generally characterized as poetry, there are many prophetic pieces in there. Obvious prophetic books are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, the 12 minor prophets, Daniel, which sometimes gets classified as history, but is most definitely apocalyptic, especially the end of the book of Daniel, and the book of Revelation, which is almost entirely apocalyptic. So are these books being taught in your church? And think of how much of the Bible they make up. They make up a, a huge chunk of the Bible, and if your church isn't teaching them, or if you're not learning about them, think of how much of God's Word you're missing out on. And if these books are being taught, or if you are studying these books on your own, are you rightly dividing? Are you aware of the prophecies that are unfolding currently in our current phase of history and those that are going to be fulfilled? Or are you being taught by teachers or resources that are telling you it's all over, you know, the book of Revelation is finished, you could stick a fork in it. It's well done, right? That's a problem because it's not actually, that's not the truth. There's still much prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled and you are responsible to rightly divide those prophecies from what has already been fulfilled. And maybe as you study prophecy, you bring up what you're learning to your teachers and to your church leaders, and maybe they'll be receptive to it. Maybe they'll realize they've been reading the Bible according to a failed methodology, or maybe they won't, and you're never gonna change them, okay? That's between them and God, how they have taught you the Bible and how they have shepherded the flock that God's going to hold them accountable, just like he's going to hold you accountable to knowing about his word, regardless of how you were taught. So educate yourselves. Educate, educate, educate. One more point I would like to make about prophecy is that when you study it and study it properly, it will give you a fire for evangelism. And we are all commanded to fulfill the Great Commission. All of Jesus' disciples were given the Great Commission. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, you should be out proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you read prophecy and you see how close we are to the end, and when I say we're close to the end, you know, I'm not setting a date. I'm not saying the rapture is going to happen tomorrow or even in my generation. I'm just saying that there is a nearness, there is an urgency. When you study prophecy, it's going to put a fire under you and you're going to want to go and evangelize. With that being said, you should already have a fire for evangelism because Jesus tells us not to wait for the harvest, but that the fields are always white for evangelism. It is always time to evangelize whether you study prophecy or not. And I do hope you study prophecy because you will be just that much more on fire to preach the gospel. And what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is the good news about Jesus. It is all the information that a human needs to be saved from hell, to be reconciled to God, and to receive a new soul and body in Jesus Christ. Well, how does any of this happen? How do I get to heaven? What you have to do is believe what I'm about to tell you. Believe that it is truth. Jesus came to earth. He is the only God that came to earth. He is the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life, the life that none of us could live. He died on the cross, and when he died on the cross, he took all of our sins onto him, and our sins were crucified with him, and then he was raised three days later. When we believe that Jesus died for our sins, God sees us the way that he sees Jesus, perfect. Okay, you and I are not perfect. You can't make yourself perfect. I can't make myself perfect. I can't make you perfect. You can't make me perfect. Sin is so bad. It is so much a part of who we are that only God himself can cleanse us of it. And because Jesus is God, he is the son of God, only Jesus is qualified and only his death could pay for our sin. Okay, I could go to God and I could say, I know I've sinned. I know I've messed up. I'll give you anything. I'll give you anything to take me. I'll give my whole, I'll give you my life. I will die if you will take my sin away and accept me as your child. And God would say, that's not good enough. Your life cannot pay for your sin. Your death is not going to cleanse you of your sin. Only my son can do that. And guess what? I love you so much 
that I sent my son to do just that. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die on that cross so that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that means anyone, anything you've done, any sin can be forgiven. The only sin that God will not forgive is unbelief. If you do not believe that Jesus died for your sins and he rose from the dead so that you can have a new body as well, because if you're going to live with God for eternity, you need to be able to live forever, which means you need an immortal body and you can't make yourself immortal, so only Jesus could do that. So if you fail to believe this, and you just go on living like, this doesn't pertain to me, or I'll think about that some other time, or I really just can't believe that this God-man came to earth and he died on the cross and was raised from the dead, or there has to be another way, or there have to be multiple ways, and what about this God and that God and this religion, and what about this prayer and this thing and that, you know, those, those aren't valid ways to God, how can you say that? If you're going to remain in that mindset and you're going to reject the truth that Jesus is the way that he is the only way for you and I or any other human to be reconciled to, to God to be called a child of God then you will suffer eternally in the lake of fire which is what we call hell hell is not a joke hell is for real and it is a horrible horrible place just think of the worst pain you have ever been in, multiply that pain by a million, and then imagine never, ever, ever finding relief from that pain. That is hell. You don't have to go there. Nobody has to go there because Jesus made a way and he paid that way with his blood. He gave his life for you willingly. Okay, nobody put Jesus on the cross without his permission because he could have taken himself down because he's God. He could do whatever he wanted. He didn't have to do that. He could have just left humanity where we were, unsaved and destined for hell. And you know why? He would have been just in doing that, because he's God. He doesn't need us, but he didn't. He willingly laid his life down, and he went to the cross, and he died for me, and he died for you. And that is, that is all you have to believe. That is gospel truth. You could believe that right now. You could believe that wherever you are, Whatever it is you're doing, you could just believe that and have eternal life. You could become a child of God right now. And that is the only way to become a child of God. There is no other way. True, we're all God's creation. We're all made in his image. But it is only to those who believe in Jesus that God is going to say, Welcome into my kingdom, my children. So I encourage you, if you have never believed this truth, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone, I encourage you to do that right now. I love you all so much, and I hope you go and study some prophecy.